So thanks, Doug. Thanks. Uh, that was a great start. Um, so happy to introduce our second speaker. Amelia J. Eich received her BA in psychology and biology from Yale and her PhD in biolog biological science and psychobiology from the University of California, Irving. She then went back to New Haven to complete her postdoc at Yale Medical School. Amelia started her independent lab at UT Southwestern Medical School in Dallas. And then finally moved to Philadelphia, where she was a professor of both anesthesiology and critical care at CHOP, Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and of neuroscience at Penn Medicine. Uh, Amelia and her team investigate how the hippocampus um, is involved in normal brain function, as well as in neurologic and psychiatric disorders in development and adulthood. And as NGT students all know, in addition to her amazing science, uh, she is known for her extensive experience and passion for training the next generation of neuroscientists. Welcome, Dr. Aish. Uh, really glad to have you here. Take it away. Great. Can you see my slides? Uh, not yet. It doesn't look like you're sharing. Okay. How many PhDs <laughs> does it take? Uh, Doug, see one, teach one. You can teach me. Remind okay. me, Ethan. Um, yeah, so there's the but the share screen button, it's like in this the bar that appears on top of your uh video, and it looks like it's like the third one from the right. I believe. Yes. You got it? Okay. Good. Got it. <laughs> awesome. Excited. Can you see my screen? Yes? Uh, still not seeing anything, unfortunately. Okay. Hmm. Trying one more thing. I'm feeling oh, good. There we about go. One. I'm feeling good. That does look better. Yep. Okay, we see it. Looks great. Thank you. Our time is a charm. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Thank you for um, putting this together, uh, Penn students, and thank you, Doug and Dong, um, for being the bread on the Amelia talk here. I um, am going to give you a talk that is slightly different than the title I gave Ethan. It's called A Stimulating Question. Can a neural circuit of memory be harnessed to combat depression, importantly, in mice? Now, this work that I'm talking to you about today was led by a faculty member um, who I also call my lab partner. And she is our leader of team anti-depression. This is Sang Hee Yun here. Um, we are like the yin and yang of the Aish Lab leadership. And so I wanted you to see her face and burn it into your brain, right? Primacy effect, the first face that you see. I also wanted to point out that this is the 15th anniversary hello, 15th anniversary of the Penn Public Lecture Series. So I decided, uh, because my goal in this lecture is not to tell you about our published work, it's to give an overview of our published work, show you some unpublished work, you know, let you in on some secrets. But most importantly, my goal is for you to remember me. And to make you remember me, I've decided to give this talk a little bit of a Philly twist. It's the 15th anniversary. There are at least 15 Philadelphia related jokes or jokes in this talk. I encourage you to count them or maybe even keep track of them as we go because there might be a little prize at the end for someone who emails me first with all the uh, Philly jokes, jokes. So before I um, talk to you about how we might be able to harness a memory circuit in the brain to combat depression, I want to talk to you about the background, literally the background of this slide. And let's see if this picture in the background rings a bell. Does this ring a bell to anybody? I hope someone is writing in the chat, I know what that is. Is it a mural in Philadelphia? Is it a mosaic perhaps? Nope, it is the hippocampal dentate gyrus. And I'm sure you remember it very clearly from Dr. Coulter's talk. 
I want to show you this for a few reasons. One, it is also the beating heart of my talk and my lab. Two, to have you remember it, right? The second point is I would like everybody, I can't see you doing this, but humor me, please. Put two Vs up in the air and cross them. That is your hippocampal dentate gyrus in your brain. You have one on each side. So you're only seeing one here, okay? Three, the other reason I wanna show it is that it does look just a little bit like a sideways hoagie, doesn't it, you know? Okay, maybe if you haven't had uh, dinner like myself, it looks like a sideways hoagie. Okay, the fourth reason I wanna show you this is because the dentate is unique in the hippocampus in that it gives rise to new neurons throughout life. What you're seeing in pink here, okay, are cell bodies. These are the cell bodies of new neurons. And then these processes that are reaching out and going upwards, those are like the antenna of these cells and they are receiving input. And these cells, I know you're gonna think I'm a little crazy, but these cells and their processes to me remind me a little bit of uh, some Philly geography, which is the rivers that surround this. I won't uh, enlarge this too much, so hopefully you can't read it, but one of these and another one of these surround Philadelphia, or at least uh, a main anchor of Philadelphia. And to me, these sort of look like uh, the split rivers. And bonus points, if in the email you send me at the end, you can spell the name of the rivers correctly and say which one's on the left and which one's on the right. Back to the dentate gyrus. So there are new neurons in this dentate gyrus. This dentate gyrus is certainly in rodents, as you're seeing here. This is this banana-shaped structure. Nice job, Ethan, on that. Here's the dentate, right? Recognize that. It's not just in rodent, it's also in humans. Here, it looks a bit like a shrimp-shaped structure in humans. And if we sliced it this direction you, and we enlarged this, you would see, guess what? The dentate gyrus. Now here you see the dentate gyrus pointed. I do wanna say that just like a hoagie, um, the dentate looks a little different if you cut it in different orientations. So here's a picture where the dentate actually looks a little round just because we cut it differently. But you can see here again in the schematic form, this whole structure is called the dentate gyrus. This hot pink cell here, this is one of these new neurons. And this is the receiving end of these new neurons. They're receiving input from a structure, the entorhinal cortex that Doug mentioned and that I'll get to in a few slides. So why should I care about the dentate gyrus? Well, it's important in a lot of functions. One that you all know, perhaps even from your textbooks, it's that it's involved with memory. Um, here, this little schematic is showing like those card games where you have to turn it over and match pairs. Um, and that gives you a hint about what the dentate is so important for. It's not just memory. Um, one aspect of it, as Ethan mentioned, is episodic memory. So before I get into the other type, the spatial memory, I thought we could just reflect as a Philadelphia community about a common episodic memory. Oh, perhaps in September, 2021, where it flooded and this incredibly smart person did a backflip off a bridge into the flooded Vine Street Expressway. But look at what's happening here. It's not just the episode here, but this guy is swimming somewhere. All right, that's enough for you. He's swimming somewhere. He has is going to a specific location. So yes, the hippocampal dentate gyrus involved with episode. I remember that episode. It was right outside my husband's office. I don't know if you remember it, but now you've seen it. Um, but it's also the memory for locations. This guy was looking for an exit. So here's a way that a mouse looks for an exit. And yes, I did mean to exit that. This is a water maze. It's a pretty funny sounding name. But you can see a little mouse here. You see it swimming along there? And you and I are fortunate in that we can see a hidden platform. You see that shadow there where I'm circling? Yeah. So that's a hidden platform. The mouse is using these random cues on the wall to get to this platform. And it is using its hippocampus to remember the location of where that platform is. This is a little close up where we say, oh, the mouse looks so cute. That's terrific. We get back into things here. 
So you, we've got this memory for location and you saw the water maze finding a hidden platform and using cues around the room, just like our very smart fellow here on the bridge used cues to get out of the flooded Vine Hill Expressway and out to safety. I wanna leave you with one other way of thinking about the hippocampus and memory for locations that's also very Philly specific. Let's say you're hungry for a cheesesteak. So many places to go. Maybe you have a favorite. Maybe when I tell you mine, I'm about to insult you. Let's say I went to Delisandro's up in Roxborough, past Manny Yonk, little off the beaten path. It's terrific. I don't like the beer so much. I actually don't even really like the meat so much, but I sure like their other sandwiches there. So memory for location. I want you to remember Delisandro's because when I talk about Delisandro's again, this talk is almost over. Okay, so we've got memory down, but there's more that the hippocampus does. The hippocampus, its other functions are underappreciated, just like most Philadelphians are underappreciated. And mood, when I say mood, I'm really using quotes, specifically when we talk about animals. The hippocampus and the dentate gyrus in particular are very responsive to change and to stress. I don't know if any of you are basketball fans, but did you know that a non-scientific study of 100,000 tweets on Twitter found that the Philadelphia 76ers basketball team were the most stressed of all NBA fans? So that means if you are a 76ers fan, your brain, your hippocampus in particular, your dentate is working overtime to try to compensate for the change and the stress. Before I move on from this, this random 76ers tangent, which did make you listen, didn't it? I wanna point out that the seven here, doesn't that look just a little bit like the dentate? I don't know if that's a coincidence or not. Okay, so the dentate gyrus is really important in regulating response to change and to stress. But in certain situations, things turn pathological and disorders develop such as major depressive disorders, which often we uh, make a short term of depression, anxiety, as Doug mentioned, even post-traumatic stress disorder. And there are rodent and human papers alike that support both a correlative and perhaps a causative function in the dentate gyrus in regulating um, the mood that and the mood dysregulation seen in these disorders. So this leads me to the main goal that we had for this summary I'm going to show you and the unpublished data. We know that dentate gyrus activity, the pulsing of the cells, as Doug showed you, and the function, memory and mood, are disrupted in many psychiatric disorders, particularly depression. So how can we, as neuroscientists who do not touch humans, how can we normalize dentate gyrus activity and functions and potentially treat these disorders? So how can we normalize dentate gyrus function? Well, you all know that there are some outstanding antidepressive reagents on um, medications, excuse me, on the market. Um, Zoloft, a little bit more for anxiety, Prozac, Paxil, Buspar, maybe Wellbutrin. So on the road to recovery for depression, what's important is that it's, it's tricky to find the right drug for each person and sometimes the right drug for certain time of a person's life. 50% of patients, in fact, on um, antidepressants relapse, and relapse can be extremely severe in depression. Fortunately, there are many new tools that we can use to develop treatments in the lab that maybe eventually we can move to bedside, move from bench to bedside. And one that I just want to uh, tip my hat to here is animal models relevant to depression. One of the animal models that my lab relies on most heavily is called social defeat stress. Now, you know how in Philadelphia there are row houses, one right next to the other, and you can hear your neighbors through it. I don't know if any of you are in that position. But what social defeat stress is like is living next to a neighbor that's not only loud, but actually is a bully. So you're, li you're living next door to this bully. And you are visit, this bully actually visits you once a day. And that makes you really stressed. It really, it shows um, the animals, this mouse, the one that is being bullied actually shows signs of depression. And 
we want to figure out how can we use this model of depression to, to develop an even broader toolbox, even more um, uh, roads and highways on the road to remission for depression. Okay, so you've got dente gyrus and activity. They're disrupted in psych neuropsychiatric disorders. Here was our idea. Could we normalize the dente gyrus, which you know well here, right? There's your dente gyrus on this side. Could we normalize dente gyrus function and activity by stimulating upstream from the dente gyrus? And what you're seeing here is a very simplified schematic of the entorhinal cortex. I am on good terms with the entorhinal cortex, so you may see it written as ent sometimes, like the tree in uh, Lord of the Rings. The perforant path, these are the processes that send into the dentate. And guess where they synapse? They synapse on the antenna of those hot pink cells and their even more mature neighbors. So this is a neural circuit, the entorhinal cortex, perforant path, dentate gyrus pathway. And we wondered, might if we stimulate th this, might we normalize the memory and mood deficits that we see in depression? Now, I would love to say that this idea of stimulating the ENT-DG pathway to normalize and improve DG function came solely from our brains. But actually, stimulation of the entorhinal cortex has been shown in humans and in rodents to actually improve memory. Challenging field, lots of um, disagreeing findings. But the score is roughly similar here. Neither side has said, no, it, uh, neither side has given up. And there is a side of the field that says, yes, stimulation of the entorhinal cortex can improve some types of memory. And certainly in humans, um, it's certainly um, acutely. In rodents, they can do it um, also to look not only at memory, but also at new neurons in the dentate, those ones with the hot pink uh, antenna. Here's the question that was not asked. We asked, okay, does stimulation of the NTG pathway also normalize and improve this other dente gyrus function, mood? And in the paper that we already published, so I won't review the data here, we found that indeed it normalized mood and memory. Very briefly, for the entorhinal cortex and the dente gyrus here, these are the pathways um, synapsing in on the antenna in the dente gyrus on the Schuylkill and Delaware rivers. There are, if we stimulate this pathway, there's more cellular activity, there's more neurogenesis, but is there antidepressive-like behavior? Using this model of depression, the bully mouse, where you live next door to a bully, we then asked this test mouse, hey, we're now gonna show you, put you in an arena, with a mouse that looks like a bully. It's not really a bully. You've never been exposed to it before, but boy, does it look like a bully. And we ask you, mouse that has been bullied, how much time do you interact with this bully mouse, with this bully-like mouse? Now you would think if that mouse looks like a bully and this mouse is sort of stressed and depressed, it might avoid, it might have less interaction time. And if it's maybe less depressed, less depressed, it might approach and have greater interaction time. And indeed, in control animals, they have a certain, they spend a certain amount of time with this bully-like animal. And in the stressed animal, chronic social defeat stressed animal, they spend less time. And interestingly, when we stimulate the ENT to DG excitatory pathway, they actually normalize it in that this is no longer different from this one. So in fact, we do show a normalization of mood or antidepressive-like behavior. All right, so in this paper, we also looked at memory and we found that EMT DG pathway stimulation improves both memory and mood. And I wanna emphasize right now that this is something that people don't often think about with depression. Depression is not just a disorder of mood. It also has um, disrupts aspects of memory. Now there are other things that the dente gyrus does that are also disrupted during depression. Doug mentioned this thing called pattern separation. And he was talking about malls and parking lots. And I completely agree with that. But I need to give you a little bit more of a Philly spin on pattern separation. 
So, you know, remember way back when I was like, hippocampus is important for memory, location memory. I'm going to go to Delisandro's in Roxboro and get my hoagie. And when I get there, I actually might discriminate between the two types of hoagies available. Um, those of you in the know know that these are called wit and wit out. No more explanation needed on that, or you can uh, look that up. Now, that's memory, but pattern separation is location discrimination. It's like you put these two parts together. So location discrimination, what I'm showing you here is a Google map of Delisandro Steaks in Rockborough, all the way down to Pat's King of Steaks, a favorite of many tourists and some people in Philadelphia. And it's a 25 minute drive. Now these are similar, they are cheesesteak shot hops, but they're really easy to tell apart because they're far apart, right? You know what's harder? Is if you go to Pat's and you walk across the street to Gino's, it's a little hard to tell them apart. So both of these are location discrimination, a type of pattern separation. But one is really easy to tell apart because it's far apart. And the other one is much harder because they're close. All right, so this pattern separation is another function that's disrupted in depression and it normalizes with effective treatment. So if we stimulate the entorhinal cortex, can we see improved pattern separation? How do we do that? We allow mice to touch a screen. I like to say it's video games, but it's much more similar to what Philadelphian uh, uh, parents of young children in Philadelphia, the Please Touch Museum go to. This is a touch screen where mice are given a series of tasks. And in one task, they know that one of these lift squares, either the left or the right, is gonna give them a treat. And when they're far apart, it's easy for the mouse to say, oh, I know which one's Delisandro's. I mean, I know which one's gonna give me a treat. But when they're closer together, it's much harder. It's much harder for them to remember which one's gonna give me a treat, which one's Pat's and which one's Delisandro's. So here's a video of um, these animals going through this and I'm going to go through it twice so you won't miss it. This mouse uh, pressed the left square there. You can see over here is the touch screen. And then it goes over here to get its uh, treat. It's a little cheesesteak. It's not really a cheesesteak. Here's the mouse again. This is easy separation, far apart. The mouse is wondering, where's my treat? Where's my treat? Presses the left, gets a reward. Now it's hard. Can you see on this side that the two squares are very close together? Much harder to tell which one's Delisandro's and the treat and which one's Gino's. But the mouse got it. So I want to emphasize just one more time here that what we're looking at are both location discrimination. And in one case, it's really easy when they're far apart on the left and the right of the screen. And then the other time when they're close together, it's much harder. Both use the dentate gyrus, but when it's close together, they use it even more. It's a sort of a gradient scale. Okay, so now I've taught you how to play video games in the ice lab. Here are these mice. We stimulated the entorhinal dentate gyrus pathway. Just a little note here that these unpublished data that I'm ending this talk with, um, these are using a second approach. You'll see some um, uh, abbreviations here that one is normal and one is essentially stimulated or disinhibited entorhinal dentate pathway. All right, so these mice that have this disinhibited or stimulated, how many trials of, do they complete? How's their speed at this? And what's their accuracy? So here's trial number. How many trials do they complete? Well, at both the easy and the hard version, they do better. Stimulation of this pathway improved trial number aspect of pattern separation. And they did that for both easy and hard. How about speed? Mm, not different in terms of how, they, how many days it took them to reach criteria for the easy, but in the hard, when it's really challenging, you stimulate that entorhinal uh, dentate pathway and the speed definitely increased. That's really interesting that it's just on the hard trials, on the telling genos from pets. And then the final one is on accuracy. There's more data, this is the last one I'll show you though, that the percent correct to getting the criteria in both the easy and the hard, they almost got there, it's right on the border. So they were more accurate, both easy and almost hard. So here's what you've learned. There are three functions of the dentate that you don't hear about as much as you do memory. 
memory, mood, and pattern separation. And all three of them are improved by stimulation of the enterinal dentate pathway. The last thing I'm gonna leave you with, there are more functions of the dentate, but the last one I'm gonna leave you with um, is important, particularly to depression. When you think about depression, one of the key symptoms is lack of, lack of a rewarding feeling in things you used to really enjoy, right? So reward is disrupted in depression and it normalizes with effective treatment. In our lab, we have an animal model for reward where an animal uh, can do different things, press a lever to give itself enjoyable stimuli. And we want to see if stimulation of the enteral cortex can rescue reward in a depressed animal. I'm leaving you back on this highway. So we started out wondering, does the enteral cortex dentate gyrus circuitry and depression, might this be a road towards remission? And what I suggest is that these four, our data suggests is that these four aspects of the dentate, memory, mood, pattern separation, go D'Alessandro's, um, and reward are um, very reliant on the dentate. And if we stimulate the enterinal perforant pathway, we can improve and normalize at least the um, deficits in memory, mood, and pattern separation. So that's why I've put it here on the sign because who knows, if we are successful in working through our translational program, maybe enterinal perforant path stimulation may someday be an exit or an offshoot on the road to remission. Future things that we're doing, a lot of molecular neuroanatomy. What's the pathways? What are they made up of excitatory inhibitory cells? Where do they project? We've got a whole posse of amazing undergraduates as well working under Dr. Yoon on that. I mentioned reward. We're very interested in looking at a causative aspect for this. We have some, but we always want more. And we're approaching trans translational studies, trying to look at the re relevance for humans. I think this work is not only eventually going to help us for a brain, treating a brain disease like depression, but it also will help us understand the normal brain and function as well. And who knows, it might even teach us something about gritty or as I might say, grit which maybe some people think helps resist against depression. I'm gonna leave you here with the amazing people that I'm so lucky to work with. Sung Hee, my lab partner is here with her team, current and past and wonderful collaborators, including some from the Coulter Lab. Chris forgot, I left you off that, sorry, Chris. Um, and then these other amazing AISH lab members, um, the postdocs, and the graduate students who I share with John Danny all have their own funding, which is amazing. I just try not to stay in their way because they're terrific. I'm leaving you my email here. Both go to the same place. If you have guesses at the number of Philly topics I mentioned, email me. If you have any questions, email me. If you want to chat on Twitter, email me or tweet me. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Amelia. That was amazing. Thanks. I know so much more about the dentate gyrus now, and I hope people are paying attention and somebody's going to get that prize. So there <laughs> if is there a is prize. a prize, maybe. Yeah. yeah. Uh, prizes, I there think. is a prize. Okay. They're, they're not a big wow. deal, but <laughs> you will be able to have bragging rights. With Philly loves bragging right. rights. Right, of course. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'm going to, uh, we're going to do a couple questions. Um, first question, um, first question is from Jake Parker. Uh, if simple stimulation of this pathway, the enterrhinal DG pathway improves memory. So why, basically, why doesn't it have a higher baseline activity to begin with? Like, how does it get to the point where, like, where the brain can't just naturally increase the activity right. of that pathway, I guess, maybe? Right. Thank you, Jake, for your question. That. At baseline, the dentate is really resistant to firing. It likes to stay really quiet. And that's challenging. It's challenging sometimes to record from these cells. Um, you might have noticed in Doug's work, when they do seizures, these cells become hyper excitable and different populations have different changes in their activity. So Jake, I think you're asking, 
you know, why doesn't the brain do it anyways? Um, some data that we didn't publish, but um, Sanghee and I really wanted to find a home for it somewhere is we were fortunate enough to get human samples from patients who died of natural causes, but who were diagnosed with depression. And these specifically were entorhinal cortex aspects, right? And in that, we found that a protein in depressed humans' entorhinal cortex was elevated relative to humans that did not have um, depression. And this protein, this elevated protein, actually served to keep everything as it were, like prevent things from firing. It's these HCN channels and tries to keep it sort of this increased protein, trip 8 b We hypothesize, and the electrophysiologists before and after me are cringing at me saying this, but I like to think of it, it's just preventing them from firing too much. So what that means, Jake, is that we think stress decreases the activity of this pathway. And so what we are doing is counteracting that stress. I know what you're thinking, Jake. You're thinking, well, wait a minute. Wouldn't you just cause a seizure, right? You just saw Doug Coulter's talk. Interestingly, and the reason why we were so lucky to collaborate with Doug when we published this work a few years ago, is that if we give a lot of stimulation, indeed, it does look like the animals have um, a seizure-like activity. But if we give controlled activity, it looks like we might be able to overcome stress-induced decrease in activity. Lots of different arrows there, very much like 95 driving arrows here and there. Um, but I hope that helped, Jake. And please write me if you would like to talk about it more. Do we have time for one more question? Thanks. Yeah, I think I think we do. And actually, you did a great job there hitting two of the questions that we had. But can I, um, Let's let's get one more. So I actually I asked a couple of questions. Uh, so, um, yeah, I guess I was asking something about causality. So this is more about sort of like towards the beginning of your talk. But do we know whether this dentate gyrus dysfunction is really feeding back and contributing to these psychiatric disorders, or is it just a reaction? Right. Well, this is where the causality aspect um, fits in. And we have a couple of strategies for that. Um, strategies as simple as um, time courses, right? Looking after stress and seeing, you know, at what point do the animals look quote unquote depressed? And at what point does their activity of that pathway look like it might be suffering a little bit, right? So time course would allow us to dissociate that, which came first, that's one. Sanghi also is brewing up several other um, clever approaches to this and um, some that are using some cutting edge um, drugs that are being used for antidepression. And I can feel her out there in the universe telling me not to say anymore, so I won't say anymore, but Time course is one way we're doing it to dissociate, you know, which comes first. And then inducibly changing certain things. Can we inducibly change the activity? What happens to function? Are there other ways that we could inducibly change the function? Does that result in any time you change, you make an animal um, better at pattern separation, does their activity always go up? Okay, so um, time course, and inducibility. Those are the two things I will say. Okay, thank you. That was wonderful. So, one uh, round of applause again Time for your talk. Long. And <laughs> yes, now uh, now I'm gonna uh, uh, Vanessa's gonna come on and introduce our last speaker. <laughs>